right, guys. Well, welcome, everyone. From me, John Alwyn Jones, your moderator and host today for another really exciting and highly topical global travel media webinar and panelist session, What Might the Future of Aviation Look Like Post-COVID, or I suppose even during COVID, at this what is, I mean, absolutely, we all know, is a very challenging time for everyone. Flights are opening up domestically. Virgin Australia has been sold to Bain Capital. Mm. More about that later, perhaps. You never know. We'll have a chat about that. Rex very bravely entering the Sydney East Coast state capital market. And I say very bravely. And Alliance also very bravely entering the Australian domestic market competitive fray. Very challenging areas for them to enter into. But good luck to them. And why not? Competition is a good thing. On to international. With overseas travel still banned for the vast majority of us, and Alan Joyce, CEO of Qantas, announcing some time ago that their international flights will not start till mid-2020, which was very interesting. While a phalanx of other airlines, including Emirates, Etihad, Qatar, and others in Asia, are ready to roll to grab their share of the future Aussie market. I suspect that the expense of and gaining market share from Qantas, we'll just have to wait and see. So tough times in travel, but for everyone dependent on and involved in aviation as well, with thousands, well, tens of thousands of aviation employees globally and in Australia stood down. I heard of one airline laying off a thousand pilots in one day. So laid off and fired. And the starkest result, example, pilots now working in supermarkets. What can I say? Times have changed and will continue to change. And the bottom line is that irrespective of a vaccine coming along, and I'm sure we all pray that will happen, COVID-19 is simply something we're going to have to learn to live with, including in travel and the subject of this webinar in aviation and flying. And it's so refreshing to see innovators throughout the world, even Boeing, talking about the ways in which they're providing technology to deal with COVID or any other pandemic sort of things that will come along. Well, it's awesome today that we have some of the aviation and travel industry's top independent specialists with us today to let you have their views of what might the future of aviation look like as a result of COVID. And sincerest thanks to all of you and all of them, I should say, and you as our audience for taking part today. What's been very interesting, and I might say disappointing, and I don't want to labor this point, is while we have an awesome panel of independent experts, every domestic and international airline we invited to participate didn't want to participate. And when Stephen, the editor of Global Travel Media, and I discussed this, we agreed we should say something in that the purpose of these webinars and everything we do at eGlobal Travel Media is to provide the best possible independent and unbiased information we can to you, our audience, to help you in your businesses. And we're doing that today with our amazing panel. But it would have been good to have some domestic and international airlines on board, but every one of them said no. It's a bit like feeling, well, I felt like I was the unpopular kid at school, you know, with the party invitations and not getting one, you know. And they had valid excuses. These are busy times. And rather than saying we only wanted the CEOs, we gave them the option of nominating someone else, but that didn't work. Maybe they simply didn't want to come on a live webinar to give their views and thoughts. I leave that one with you. Rant over. But airlines, we want to work with you. But please, please, please make it easier. So here we are with a team of top independent aviation specialists, industry specialists as well. And this is a no sales pitches, no spin, just facts and no airlines aviation webinar. The webinar should go for about an hour, but we're going to keep it going this time rather differently to the cruise one uh, because we had to terminate that one. But we'll keep it going as far as we can through with the questions. And the session is being recorded. It's available on Facebook Live as well. So please ask us at any time if you need any help in finding those. Generally, the panelists will be speaking in full screen, as I hope I am now, but we may switch backwards and forwards because, you know, what Zoom is like it can sometimes have its own um, its own will in the world. All the technical stuff is being run by one of the new owners of Global Travel Media, that's Stu and Gam with Stu in our Bangkok office there, and he'll give you a little wave now, and he's running the technical side. We ask for questions, as you know, and I'll do my best to get through those at the end. But if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, and we do have a lot of questions, but if it's of a particular panelist, then go to the chat button on your Zoom screen, ask the question, say who you want to ask it of, and we'll see if we can get through it. 
Now, these are very, very busy times. And unfortunately, both Peter Harbison and Jeffrey Thomas had to withdraw for unavoidable personal reasons. They were very upset at having to withdraw and there were very valid personal reasons. So let's get going with each of our amazing panelists who now have six minutes each to give our audience the view of the world in what might the future of aviation look like, even in COVID or post COVID. So our first speaker today is Joanna Liu. Now she's head of consultancy Asia for Ascend by Syria. And they're said to be the most extensive aviation specialist giving insights the market has to offer to airlines. They give a global view of the market, bringing the context of changes and risks and opportunities for airlines. And Joanna's a trusted advisor to governments, regulators, investors, airlines, airports, specialists plan in planning airports and design, all sorts of things. A real specialist, a real pleasure to have Joanna with us today. And she appears regularly on CNBC Asia. So Joanna, what are your views about what the future of aviation might look like? Over to you, Joe. Thanks, John. And uh, good to uh, see everybody here. Uh, I probably I just need to share a bit of slides. And um, John, I need you to, uh, a, a, it says the host, host disabled the participant screen sharing. So I want okay. to help from you. That's okay. Stuart will deal with that now. Can you give us a thumbs up, Stu, if it's okay, or you're muted, Stu. Let me just check. I thought that these were allowed. Uh, two seconds. Two seconds, bit of technology. Thank goodness it's not on the flight deck. <laughs> um, it says that you should be able to hear. Mm. What what message? Sorry, what uh, message are you getting up there? What do you it just says get... host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh. Sorry. Oh no worries. If the technical issue is still there, and I can uh, maybe just without slides and uh, if you're okay with that, Joe, feel free. Carry on. Yeah, of course. Continue on, and I'll get on it now. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so um, my, I, I just uh, verbally talk about that. My first slide was uh, uh, trying to give you a quick look at all the, um, the global completed flights throughout 2020 on the day, on a daily basis using our Sirium's uh, flight stats data. So the seven day rolling average um, number of uh, the completed flights and uh, the canceled flights um, total, uh, totally the complete flights was about 48,000 increased from the end of July. And uh, this is a less than 50% of the completed flights compared to that of the beginning of the year. And the seven, uh, seven day rolling average percentage of a flight canceled was still uh, quite uh, dramatic at around 20%. And then we uh, go into look at the capacity, which is the, 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 uh, the flight uh, schedules data. So our schedule data also shows a bit of an advanced uh, look, not just now we are in a September, but also we look into October and probably November and end of the year as well. And our schedule data shows that our end of October might see a potential recovery to around the 30% down on a yearly, year, year on year basis, and look at a quite some um, increase uh, versus the current level of a 60% down. So, but, but because of airline, and they all uh, will adjust their schedules from time to time. Uh, now it's on a more, um, on a weekly basis because of a pandemic, it's very likely that still we will see cutbacks in the near future. And also, uh, if we look at uh, some uh, like uh, market pairs in terms of re re recovery patterns by markets, China domestic schedules already achieved the last year's level and it shows the possibility to have a double digit growth over last year um, by October. And the US domestic and intra Europe market is expected to experience lift in capacity to around 40% down year on year. 
as a result of the releasing of the uh, restrictive measures. An intra-Asian market seems to still have a bit of a long way to go uh, in resuming uh, the, the flight capacity. But we also look at the recovery of Asian countries. Um, looking at Asia Pacific, we, uh, we look at all the seeds in and out of each country. So the expected growth are all in different levels, uh, particularly, uh, unfortunately for Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, because with no domestic markets, they have generally lost the majority of the capacity throughout the, the major part of the year. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, China has recovered quickly, only driven by the domestic growth. Um, country so, with also- so can, I, can I interrupt you for one second? I think you can share now. Excuse oh, really? Yep, I think so. Oh, yes. He does say that. Good man, isn't he? It's great. We just see if it'll work now. Oh, here we go. Oh, cool. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, let me just quickly go Let's through go slide the slides. So this, the first one was uh, about the uh, uh, scheduled, uh, the the already flown data, flown flights, um, and then I go into talk about global schedule. As, as you can see at, at this moment in September, we are around here and still 60% down compared to last year. But uh, looking at October, uh, it's probably uh, will be uh, possible that we can see a bit of increase. But having said that, uh, we have to bear in mind that uh, airlines will have a uh, week by week uh, schedule readjustment. Re so it's still very likely to be cut off. Um, yeah, so this is about US uh, the, by different markets, US domestic, China, domestic, intra-Asia, uh, intra-Europe, transatlantic, and that China clearly you can see that uh, it's pretty much back to the last year's level. Um, but uh, we, uh, if, if we look at next year, sorry, if we can look at next month, it looks like we'll go have a like double digit growth compared to year on year of, uh, compared to last year, same time. Um, having said that, it still probably will, will have a bit of a readjustment re on schedule. And uh, we also look at US and uh, intra Europe. It's, it's been recovered uh, slowly, um, but it, unfortunately, when we look at intra Asia, it's still a bit of a very slow, around the 70% down compared to last year. Um, if that's due to a lot of countries are still uh, in the lockdown situation. So finally, um, we look at some individual countries in Asia Pacific. Um, we, uh, we look at all the seats in and out of each country. So the expected growth are all in different levels. As I said, Hong Kong, Singapore here in, it, is very much in the bottom level and they lost the momentum for the whole year. And, and then China is pretty much back to last year's level. But uh, interestingly, if we look at Japan and uh, Korea, uh, we also have a big domestic markets. They have been experiencing some uh, up and downs in the status of a virus containing. So uh, the level of capacity is not back to the uh, satisfied level yet. If we look into Australia, remained the key uh, underperformer due to the travel restrictions between states and the territories, um, both passenger volume and capacity on domestic routes stayed close um, to historical lows. Oh. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the barrier left mostly also to say the webinar, okay. Sorry about that, keep on going. Uh, okay. No worries. And so we observed a potential trend in schedule planning for October uh, to resume for all countries, but is, it is possible that uh, uh, almost certain actually, um, there are risk of a near-term negative adjustment by the airlines. Right, and finally, I just want to talk uh, about uh, our, um, our uh, views on the future recovery of the 
market. Mm -hmm. So firstly, uh, demand is, all, is, is most fundamentally impacted uh, in international markets where travel restrictions have uh, driven demand, mm -hmm. the consequent supply to very low levels, generally 70% to 90% down uh, over 2019 before demand in these, these markets can start to, to recover, those restrictions will need to be lifted on a uh, bilateral basis in each case. And domestic markets are showing stronger signs of a recovery, which is logical um, because in these cases, there, are, there, there is only a single government which needs to be comfortable with the control of the pandemic. And China is an example. However, um, as we head into the, the North Hemisphere winter season and the leisure market we have seen to date is likely to soften. As a travel restriction is and that demand may start to return and uh, at that point, consumer confidence will uh, be a key driver to the leisure recovery. A vaccine must be a key driver of that. And we talk about business travel recovery is likely to come later than the uh, leisure market uh, um, because the 2020 season is all, almost um, already lost. And there are def uh, differing drivers uh, within that, including travel for intercompany business, travel events, uh, trade events, and uh, intra-company business. Some of these travels are potentially structurally will be changed as we learn to how to work remotely, virtually with each other, but others will uh, come back in some way, um, shape uh, or form in the 2021 or later. But one issue we, we, we haven't spoke much was uh, the economic, e economic impact on demand. Even when the pandemic uh, 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 is gone, and uh, now uh, we will look at the driver. What's really drive the market is probably the, the, um, the, the disposable income and the corporate profitability and the ability of customers to purchase air travel. So airlines have opportunity to stimulate demand here and there um, and reducing fares, but it will be a big challenge for airlines uh, if they reduce the uh, uh, the fares and what's the what's the profitability would look like and the utilizations would look like, and that's it. Oh, what I want to share in the six minutes. Thank you, Joe. Um, no, that was excellent. And look, I mean, it looks extremely interesting. I mean, I just wrote some notes down here. But um, in terms of Australia, with the international borders for Australia effectively closed, have you been seeing any information come through on that? I mean, is there a pent up demand? I mean, taking into account the economic factors, uh, which may mean that Australians or some Australians don't have a huge amount of money to travel going forward. But for the airlines, is there a pent up demand so that when Australia does open its um, international routes that um, there'll be significant demand? Um, yes, uh, we've seen that uh, Australia government has been quite stringent in uh, containing um, and the virus and trying to uh, 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 lock down the ho the whole country. Actually, uh, the mm. looks like it, the, the performance was quite good in that sense. Um, but having mm. said that, it does it does have an impact in the airline business and economy um, performance. So we 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 do see that uh, uh, once other other uh, countries are start to open the international travel market it will be uh, quite challenging for, for Australia, um, the airlines in Australia to catching up. Um, yeah. But I think the fundamental issue is still uh, with the government to, to, to try to collaborate with, with each other to, to uh, address the root cause, which is the virus. Um, then uh, uh, all the travelers are, will feel uh, more confidence to start to fly back to normal. Lovely, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. And look, thank you for joining us from Singapore today. You're in Singapore, aren't you? That's I'm right. in Hong Kong. In Simon. Hong Kong. My apologies. And thank you for joining us today. Um, Simon Westaway, are you with us? I certainly am. G'day, John. Oh, Simon Westaway, CEO of the Australian Tourism Industry Council, a director of Royce 
uh, Roycecom. Now, Simon is one of Australia's most experienced executive business strategy and corporate affairs leaders. I've met him several times in his corporate affairs roles, working in Australasia, Southeast Asia, Companies he'd worked for, BHP, the Qantas Group, including Jetstar, I remember those days, Tourism Australia, Orica, Medibank, and he's now combines his work with being the CEO of the Australian Tourism Industry Council, whilst he also advises, advises through Roycecom, large and small enterprises, and also engaging government on a range of corporate, strategic, media, digital, public affairs. And he has extensive business and aviation experience. So, Simon, what might the future of aviation look like? Over to you. Cheers, John. Um, thanks for the opportunity. We used to spar a lot over the years. It's um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely catch up, maybe fuck with us again one day at some point. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, cool. stu I'm stuck here in COVID Melbourne, but uh, the numbers are going south in a pretty good way now. So we've got an update from our premier on Sunday. So we'll see where that that lands. Look, I just I did want to just take a, a few moments. Thanks for the opportunity to talk, and I really wanted to try to address that question of what might the future of aviation look like. Now, I've built a bit of a tourism segue into it. Um, John's right, I was one of the uh, founding executives of Jetstar. Um, Shane Pete Harvison wasn't on, we, we go way back as well, but uh, um, we could have swapped some notes as we were chatting. But um, then I was also part of a, the Impulse Airlines group, which did an unsuccessful domestic startup and that morphed into Jetstar many years later. So I've had uh, worked directly with Alan Joyce, uh, Bruce Buchanan, a number of those guys. Um, Gosh, you know, yes. We know very well. So um, yeah, I still keep an eye on the aviation industry. Um, it's a bit hard to get the gas out of my system, but uh, I have in sort of later years got into the resources side of things and then came back with some corporate consulting activities in recent years and, um, and had the ability to come back and help the SME sector, the small business sector in the tourism industry, which is for those who understand it well, Phil Hoffman knows it very well. We're, we're, an, industry of, we're an industry of SMEs, um, which is why we're feeling, feeling it with the, the, the you know, not as strong a balance sheet. Um, I'm just going to uh, touch on four areas, John. Uh, happy to do some Q&A later on if we've got some time. So just the Australian tourism, um, the interface there with the aviation industry. So just for those on the call that aren't um, across it, uh, the government says uh, one in 12 Australians are associated with employment in the tourism and visitor economy in terms of either an inbound or an outbound um, activity, aviation, uh, hospitality and the work. So it's a huge part of our, our country about $152 billion visitor economy it was in Australian dollars at the end of 2019. And what's important around that is that the domestic market, the interstate market, intrastate as we call it, uh, made up around about 110 billion and the remainder is in that international sector. Now the international sector, as Phil will probably allude to, um, has grown a lot in the last 10 to 15 years, off some good strategies, a lot of air capacity, and just you know basically us better positioning ourselves as a brand. And John, you've covered this for uh, a long time now. Um, but importantly, within Australia, we have the seventh largest, we did have the seventh largest domestic air, um, airline industry globally. So the domestic market in Australia, as we all know, is a very dynamic market. And obviously, it was the profit centre for Qantas uh, for, for many, many years, and obviously Virgin in their better days and so forth. So um, that, and then on top of all of that, we have that we're uh, one of the top 10 global tourism markets by spend. So globally so that includes france and all the rest of it so and we are the longest of the long haul within that that that's those 10 markets so i guess what i'm saying to you is that um and with the highest per per international passenger in terms of yield which means we're an expensive place to visit and get to <laughs> but yeah. what it, all of that washes in together shows that it's actually a very valuable part of our economy it's about five percent of ex oh, sorry, a bit under five percent of exports uh and about um you know three and a half percent of um gdp so in all of that, um, we, we're faced obviously with the, with the bloody virus, as I call it, and, um, and the industry is halved in collective value across the board inside eight months. Um, it's been cataclysmic. I mean, you can, any, any adjective you want to apply to it applies. Um, we are seeing some green shoots in terms of drive, drive travel and day trips at the wineries in places with low COVID transmission. But as we all, all know, it's um, been really heavily impacted. I just want to talk a little bit about the domestic aviation game because really, quite frankly, if we don't get domestic aviation rebooted in this country, not only is the tourism industry in a lot of trouble, but um, a whole lot of other things as well. So don't believe the bulldust that people are saying, everything's suddenly getting better again. The reality is if we don't get flights going interstate, and it's fantastic to see Qantas this morning getting flights into Adelaide, absolutely fantastic. Uh, and uh, hopefully that's going to now be the catalyst <coughs> for some of the uh, recalcitrant 
to straight stage to start to realise they're going to have to do do something. I think South Australia is going to do very well in the next few months, hopefully, um, with um, with some some capacity back and forward. But just to put some, some numbers around these, I mean, domestic aviation volumes are down 92 uh, percent. It's been that way for a few months now. Now, obviously, it's big numbers. Uh, but the Sydney Melbourne route, we all know, it's one of the largest routes in the world. Um, normally carries at least 700,000 um, passenger movements a month. Um, it recorded 56,000 last month, and um, yeah, it's just terrible. And it, it's really going to have a significant impact. And obviously, from the international point of view, we welcomed about five and a half thousand people back into the country, including residents returning in the last from the last month. So it's very poor, it's very bad. Our organisation, which I represent, are obviously pushing hard, and we have been pretty public about getting the arrivals cap up, if nothing else, to bring our own people back home. But uh, we've got to keep as an industry be collective and cheap, trying to push the push the envelope and get the arrivals cap up as high as we can. And obviously, no cap would ultimately be ideal. Um, there's probably two other insights I want to talk a little bit about, and one is around COVID clean travel, and then a little bit about where I see the marketplace now. Um, in terms of the marketplace now, I I don't like Prince as a performer. Um, I know he's long dead, but I the, the, that party like 1999 song. I just was thinking about it, just making some notes for this um, presentation quickly this morning. But um, back in 1999, we had a pretty dynamic or about to evolving aviation industry, as John will know well. We had Qantas, we had Ansett in a lot of trouble, um, privately and obviously publicly, it ultimately came out. Um, we had two startups that were about to launch, Virgin, Virgin Blue and Impulse Airlines, the company I was associated with. Uh, and then, so we had four domestic carriers in, in the year 2000. We had the Sydney Olympics. Mm. Aviation industry was really staying to harm. Um, you know, the deregulatory activities that the government had put in place or governments had put in place, slot allocations at Sydney Airport were really starting to kick in and investors were seeing the opportunity. Now, sadly, what, what we saw what happened, obviously, with ANSET um, and obviously Impulse went that way as well, although Impulse was purchased by Qantas and came back as Jetstar. Um, but um, we saw the market had to recalibrate again. But off the back of that, and then the LCC performance of Jetstar from 2004, Virgin were a very aggressive player, ultimately moved towards a slightly higher position in terms of their market status and brand and positioning with the two, two class cabin. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've had a very dynamic aviation industry in Australia. I mean, in recent years, the, the growth had started to taper off, but I mean, in, in Jetstar's early days, we were punching in 40, 50% capacity boots per annum mm. compound into a collective bunch of markets and made them sustainable. So really interesting times. We're going to have the situation potentially in 2021 where Rex have, have, have said they're about to raise capital. They've got a lot of slots at Sydney Airport. You must remember that. You've got uh, Virgin, obviously, under Bain. Uh, and then we've got Qantas, obviously. And uh, they've still got, obviously, got that loaded gun in Jetstar that's still in their, um, in their holster. So we could have a position where we're going to have a lot more domestic aviation activity within our own market here next mm. year, which I think will be fantastic. Whether or not it's all sustainable or not, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I'm a bit reflective. Two, two decades ago, we're starting to come around again with uh, multiple multiple brands back in, in the marketplace. And Simon, so, do you see the potential of a bit of a price war? Well, I think so. I think, um, I, I know there was a bit of reporting this morning that Qantas's fares into Adelaide were, were a bit high, but uh, they're inundated. And to be fair to the group, I think they've only had a few days to try to get capacity back into the system. Mm. So... Um, yeah, I think mm. there will be some pretty sharp bears, to be honest, particularly in those uh, traditional flatter, flatter yeah. times. So. I think the other thing that's interesting at the moment is that um, people have become really stimulated about their own country. They're really excited about being in Australia and so on. And I think, you know, the South Australian scenario at the moment, as you say, I think South Australia will do very well. But I also think post the freedom, even if overseas happens to an extent, there's going to be a strong demand for domestic as well, I think. And, and that could impact on... Uh, on uh, aviation as well with um, you know demand for seats to get to places like WA and up to Broome and up to Darwin and so on. Yeah, I think so. It's gonna be interesting. We'll see how the, some of the states play out with their, uh, their border restrictions. But uh, yeah, I yeah. think you will see some competitiveness and that competitive dynamic with the extra carriers. I mean, Virgin are gonna to have to develop a sustainable offering and um, they'll have to be sharp on fares to get customers back no matter how strong people say their brand is. So. I think that's interesting. The final point is just around COVID clean travel. And um, I mean, that was fascinating. Some of those graphics that Joanna pulled up towards the end of her presentation, just showing how different parts of the world are, are dealing with the virus and how in many ways they're, they're charging on a bit like a Trump <laughs> head towards the, the, the abyss or, or success, I suppose. I don't want to get too political. Um, but, um, but I think it's interesting because I think we are going to have to really find a solution that works in, in the Australian context. Um, 
it is going to move more towards biometrics. It is, it is going to move more towards, um, you know, how that uh, the many touch points as part of the travel experience are really well managed. I mean, it'll be well managed by the airlines on the plane. I mean, the, the air systems and so forth are absolutely fantastic, but it's all the bits and pieces before you get on the aircraft that are, I think are the, the threat as well as will business travelers be allowed to truly travel by their own company, let alone with their own, their own, by their own selves. But I think, you know, I think if I, one sort of uh, um, end point here, I think Australia has some of the best technology in the world around in passenger screening, processing, biometrics. Um, there's a company called Elenium in this country, which is doing a lot of work with Etihad. And they're doing a lot of work with some of the major airports around the world, Changi in Sydney, um, obviously in Doha, we've had a, um, with, with Eddie had and uh, in the US. And uh, what I really hope is that we don't get too much regulatory sort of over uh, um, over the top to try to make this too too difficult a process. I mean, in, I think you're right, John. I think you, I think people will want to travel, or certainly a large decent parts of the population yeah. will want to travel again for commercial and leisure and visiting friends and family. Yeah. I think we've got to let them get on with it and then put the processes in place to ensure that we um, effectively mm. trap the virus. And um, yeah, look, that's probably about it. I've, pr I've probably got to touch over six minutes. I think just finally on the international border, we sit in a lot of meetings um, and uh, I'd be worried about where the international border is at, to be honest with Australia. Mm. I, think, um, I think we're looking probably second quarter 2021. I mean, I think Qantas's read on this is about as accurate as anyone's. And I mean, yeah. I'd, I take seriously what they say and they're not saying until <laughs> mid next year. So we have Qatar as the largest operating airline in the Australia at the moment, but they're obviously operating with the arrivals cap and all the yeah. restrictions around that and obviously but moving a lot of freight. So it's it's going to be interesting. Well, thank you very much indeed. I dropped out then. My apologies for that. It's okay. Uh, let's go across to Phil Hoffman, as I mentioned before, undoubtedly a doyen. And thank you very much indeed, Simon. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, Doyen of the industry, started in 1990. Um, now he's got 220 staff in 10 branches, annual turnover, 155 million. But I know aviation is one of the passions of his life because he knows that his business is dependent on good aviation connections. So, Phil, what might the future of aviation look like? Over to you. Well, John, I enjoyed the comments, both of uh, Simon and Joe, of what they're saying and some of their figures. Um, you know, we were thrilled yesterday to have the announcement that uh, they've opened domestic to Sydney. We couldn't understand why it took so long, considering, you know, New South Wales' good figures and our good figures. Um, we, we, we just need it, uh, you know, but there's also a lot of confusion, John, out in the marketplace. And I'm mm -hmm. running into clients all the time that think they can't go domestically because of some of the reports they're reading in the paper about New South Wales and Queensland and whatever. So yeah. we've had Queensland and Northern Territory where no quarantine period is required coming back, but the confusion out in the market is what's really hurting us. Yeah. And I know we talked about, I think Simon raised up and, and Joe about consumer confidence. We really need to get that consumer confidence about the safety of traveling on the planes. It's still out there making people very nervous about you know the safety on aircraft. And yet we know as John, as Simon just said about you know, the air filters and everything else and the check-ins. So it's just yeah. getting that confidence there. Um, there is so much pent up demand, John. It's really interesting when they say yeah. that we think there might be a hesitation. I'm not getting that. I, I do three radio programs live every week where uh, people can call in. And yeah. the biggest question is by all of them is, when can we travel? When yeah. can we go? Why can the cricket team of Australia go to London and we can't? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, why can the golfers go to bloody America and basketball and everything else yeah. and tennis players and yet the average person can't travel or take the risk and that's yeah. the annoying part but I, I'm certainly confident you know like you take Tasmania now in South Australia we have no cases here Tassie has no, no cases here and he, 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 yeah. he took the date from opening from August the 24th to August the 30th and now December the 1st and then he'll probably wait for Christmas and there are yeah. no cases and we can fly with Jetstar direct so I get angry that the, the premiers you know we are now seven countries virtually you know yes uh, yeah. like you could fly into Canberra the other day they announced last Tuesday we can fly into Canberra into the ACT 
We mustn't leave the ACT territory. We now can because they've opened up New South Wales. But who yeah. wants to go to bloody Canberra? Not a lot of people. But I think the yeah. politicians opened it up so that we could go for the budget. You know, that doesn't help yeah, us with tourism. You know, so. But how? But how do know, we fix hearing, this, Phil? How how do we bring the well, pressure to I, bear I, I, to fix? Yeah, I, I I think we've got to get out there and talk to the press and get some much more positivity and stop the politicians and the health ministers controlling the whole economy of Australia. They have done so much damage. And uh, and when you see some of the anomalies that are happening with people who can go and, and can do traveling, and we can't with the ordinary traveler mm. who wants to pay money, you know, yeah. uh, like Qantas, you know, coming online with New South Wales uh, yesterday, you know, I looked in the computers uh, yesterday when I was going on radio to talk about it. And, you know, one flight a day out of Adelaide. I mean, you know, why don't give them a week's mm. warning so we could then go, yes, there's a lot of capacity. Yes. Uh, because we we're coming up with school holidays, so yeah. you know we're letting we're letting uh, uh, politicians control this whole industry. And when John, you know, when Simon quoted some of the figures, it is a a big industry. One in twelve, as he commented there, in mm-hmm. 152 billion dollar industry, they're killing it. And if we don't get some positivity and get all the flights around Australia, you know, the, the guy in WA won't even talk to anybody. I mean, it's mm-hmm. criminal because it's it a is. big travel market for us. So, you know, we need that. And, and the other thing we need is we need some travel bubbles. We've got to give some confidence in the national market. We'll return. And I believe we should be flying to New Zealand and we should be flying on then to be, uh, Fiji and some of the, the Pacific Islands. That would be the first bubble that I think we should be yeah. working on. And the second is Asia with Singapore and Japan. And we've Brilliant. just got it. We're, we're not going to eradicate it. We've got to contain it. And if we do all the precautions that we're talking about, it makes a big difference. And so I'm angry that the fact that it's taken so long to get to this stage, because you know I'm losing staff every week. And and uh, yesterday, one of the most senior staff read off the list of how many people we've lost to other industries. And John, experience is walking out the door that we won't get back because they won't trust the industry because we can't give any deadlines of when it's going to return. And so we're hurting on every front. But the thing that I've had is I've encouraged staff to be with me for a long time, some of my staff up to 25 years. And John, I'm losing them and that experience out the door. Yeah, well, thank you. Sorry, Look, I, I, get a bit you. Emotion, I get a bit emotional about it. No, no. I talk to uh, our Premier and our Treasurer about mm. uh, staff and losing mm. staff. They beat their drums when they employ or get another company in the South Australia and they're going to employ 15 staff. I said, I am talking about saving 234 jobs, yeah. not losing those 230 and the experience that goes with that out the door. Yeah. Thanks, John. No, look, Phil. No, no, not at all. I agree with you. I mean, confusion, clearly, okay? Consumer confidence. Are governments going to listen? I mean, if people locally get onto their local radio stations and get onto the local newspapers and start telling the stories, do you think government will listen? Because if anybody at your level can talk to government, it's people like you, <laughs> but are they listening to you? Well, John, I, I open up every program, uh, yeah. every every time I do a program with, with border, talking about border uh, openings and not openings, you know, so that the, I'm trying to get the confusion out of the door. Yeah. Uh, and so, Rich, but as I said, it, it's hard work because, you know, you get the suddenly the police commissioner saying, don't leave South Australia because we're very safe. Well, hang on, that just doesn't breed any confidence. But when people go, but also, uh, John, another thing we've got to watch is the security at the airport with the police, you know, controlling you coming in and out, it frightens a lot of people, you know, with yeah. all the paperwork that's going on and the length of time now it takes to come back into your, your, your airport that used to be, you know, a smooth entry in, uh, you know, and now they're saying, I'm getting asked every question in the world, show me photograph ID for my kids and everything else. John, we're yeah. making it hard to travel again and, yeah. and that's crazy. Well, I think we've got to persuade the... Uh the governments and the authorities and the people in power. But look, it's a good segue across to another doy end of the industry. Barry Mayo, are you with us today? I am indeed. Hey, Barry, how are you? He's Chairman and Director of House of Travel Australia, Chairman of Travel Managers, 50 years in travel and aviation industries. Clearly, the drugs and the makeup is working really well on him. So six airlines, the startup for tour wholesaling business, managing director of an international tour operator, huge experience, and also on many, many boards and organizations. And he's a recognized industry opinion former and has well-considered views. So Barry, what might the future of aviation look like from your perspective? 
Well, I'm going to comment from a travel agent's perspective, John, on the contribution travel agents can make towards aviation recovery from COVID-19. COVID's already had a huge influence on the structure of the aviation industry, the future composition of airline fleets, the way airlines and airports work, and on, the ongoing, on their ongoing product offerings. The most notable is increased health and safety measures that will be mandatory, not just across the aviation industry, but across all tourism and hospitality related businesses. Health and hygiene measures, health and hygiene measures across all travel products will be vital and travel agents are ready to be a one-stop central source for information, whether it be about airlines, cruise companies, tour operators, holiday resorts, or individual destinations. A major challenge will be keeping abreast of updates that will be going, that will be going, ongoing rather, as countries and regions within countries go through different stages of recovery. While information will be available on airline websites and call centre staff will be equipped <clears throat> to deal with these matters, their access to information is limited to their product and not the product of other suppliers. While COVID has resulted in a rapid increase in people working remotely and shopping remotely, some prospective travellers can be expected to have issues of fear and trust. Yeah. Therefore, I expect to see more travellers booking with live, in-person travel agents so they have someone on hand to help them should arrangements not proceed as planned. I base this on the different experiences between travellers who had booked direct with airlines or via an OTA, where when travel was disrupted, they were an anonymous caller when compared to travellers who had a travel agent or a personal travel manager. These differences have not been lost when travellers caught up in the COVID border closures and canceled flights have compared experiences while a person booking online has frequently encountered delays and other communication issues, those booking through a professional travel agent have experienced the benefit of having their own personal representative advocate on their behalf to ensure the most convenient and effective outcome. The personal representation applies to all professional travel agents and is of noticeable benefit to those travelers with multi-stop itineraries that have interconnecting components across several suppliers and in some cases, varied destinations. Never has the value of a live travel agent been more apparent to travelers than to those who have been impacted by COVID, whether it's been during travel, pre-travel or post-travel. This benefit of dealing with an experienced and knowledgeable travel professional who knows and understands each customer as opposed to being an anonymous inquirer at the end of a call center phone or an email has never been more pronounced. Absolutely. Recent feedback from clients and consumer inquiries has shown that while travel inquiries have been relatively limited, there are leisure travel inquiries for domestic bookings and to those short haul overseas destinations that have received publicity as part of the uh, prospective travel bubbles, which would support what Phil was saying earlier about opening up the bubbles. Mm -hmm. This would also indicate that there's significant demand once the state and region, regional borders reopen. Encouraging though, has been the number of older consumers asking about Europe and other long haul destinations for travel from the second half of 2021 and into 2022. These inquiries though are often linked to development of an effective vaccine. Yeah. As for stimulating demand, Airlines can be expected to undertake various initiatives, including low fares to selected destinations, bonus frequent flyer points, or incremental status points. Leisure travel, ideally combining air and land as a single purchase, with all holiday components guaranteed to meet the highest, level, highest levels of COVID health and safety standards, will be the major driver of volume and growth. <clears throat> Excuse me and will grow more rapidly than business travel. An example is Europe where leisure travel is driving much of the increase in airline capacity right now. Business travel is forecast to be impacted by duty of care concerns for employees and, is, and will be influenced by increasing use of Zoom for video meetings and conferences. Health risks will be paramount even where COVID appears to have been contained. Implementing strict health measures at airports and in flights such as pre-flight temperature screening, symptom tracking devices, contact, training, contact 
contact tracing apps and increased sanitization will be a priority, as it will be in all segments of travel and tourism industries. The provision of insurance against health and quarantine costs yeah. in the event of further outbreaks or restrictions as part of an airfare or a package cost or via an industry travel insurance policy will be essential. Airlines could assist travel agents to more effectively market leisure travel by providing wholesale domestic fares with extended ticketing time limits. This would allow time for consumers to research alternative holiday offerings and for travel agents to convert inquiries to bookings. By providing wholesale domestic fares sold as part of an all-inclusive air and land package, this could have a role in assisting airlines to maintain price integrity while limiting yield dilution from air only buyers purchasing the lowest fare of the day. Flexibility will be critical in these uncertain times. Consumers will want to know that if they book a flight or holiday, they have the freedom to change or cancel their booking and be guaranteed a full refund in the event of another COVID outbreak. Right. Having commented on how travel agents might influence aviation's recovery, I would summarize as follows. Live contact with real people who can be easily reached in person and be accountable once a sale is made will be the traveler's most trusted source to learn about COVID's impact on individual travel components and destinations in a volatile environment. A major learning for many travelers and their friends and relatives as a result of the disruption created by COVID already has been the benefit of booking with a live person who's dedicated to their well-being and protecting them against all eventualities. And finally, all segments of the aviation, travel and tourism in industries have been severely impacted and close cooperation in achieving a speedy recovery and keeping mm -hmm. businesses open and people employed should be the joint priority of industry and all governments. And I'd echo Phil's comments there in respect of the governments. That's, that's my piece. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Barry. Yeah, I mean, do you think it's, part, it's partly the time for us to also institute this name change from travel agencies? Because whose agent is a travel agent at the end of the day? I mean, my view is the travel agent is the agent of a customer. But in fact, legally, they're the agents of the airline and the hotelier. But, you know, travel advisor, travel professional, travel consultants, you know, because... And, and the paper service. So in other words, you know, if you're dealing with one of your um, home-based travel agents... Um, they sh I should be paying them a fee for doing this to be my advisor. And when things go pear-shaped in Europe and the airline goes bust or there's a pandemic or whatever, I know I can call them. And I've had personal experience of that through some friends where they booked through a travel agent. It was all sorted and dealt with, whereas somebody else had booked through an online agency and there was nobody on the end of the phone. So is it time to call them advisors, consultants rather than agents? Will that help? I think, uh, John, one of the things is if you talk about travel advisors, whether it's industry or whether it's government, et cetera, they're recognized at the moment as travel agents. Yeah. I think the correct terminology or better terminology is travel advisor, but yeah. it's also a question about educate, educating people as to how yeah. to refer to us. Yeah. Good. All right, Barry, thank you very, very much indeed. Really appreciate your input there. Uh, we're going to go across now to Greg Waldron, who's Asia Managing Editor of Flight Global. And this is the aviation industry's most visited and trusted website, according to Flight Global. I have no reason to uh, not trust them on that. Breaking news, analysis, opinion I get. Uh, I've looked at Flight Global, some wonderful material in there. Greg makes regular TV appearances to discuss the industry, speaks at conferences, and he's going to bring a sort of an Australian, but also across the region and also Asia centric view from his perspective to what might the future of aviation look like. And he's going to talk about a bit the metal situation. Those of you who are plain um, fans will know metal means planes. So, Greg, tell us your views about what might the future of, the avi of aviation look like. And you're in Singapore today, yes? Yes, sir, John. I've been in Singapore since um, January. So, oh, wow. Always in Singapore. Never get away. And I can't say I speak at many conferences now because of these, but it's great to be here at least yeah. uh, virtually. But let me um, jump right into it. Um, you know, the, the Australia, when I think of aviation, I always think of, you know, Qantas, you know, the 747 and the A380. 
And if there's any impact that coronavirus has had on the you know, near and medium term future of the sector, it's going to be on airline fleets. And specifically, um, it's really the death knell of aircraft such as the 747-400 and the A380. Now, 747, as everybody knows, was you know, famously retired by Qantas uh, quite recently. It was supposed to you know, last a bit longer in Qantas service, but it had to go because of the virus and so forth. And, um, you know, COVID-19 really accelerated the departure of this iconic, uh, famous aircraft from the world's airline fleets. Um, you know, four engines, quite inefficient um, you, relative to the new aircraft like the 787 and particularly the 777. And it was a true icon of the 1990s, but the arrival of COVID means an, it's an experience which unfortunately, you know, we won't get to enjoy again. And then moving on to the other, um, major four engine type that we all know, uh, the A380. Now, Qantas, of course, has put its aircraft in the desert. Um, Alan Joyce has said that, yeah, you know, it might come back 2023, 24, as I think is what he said. SIAs, um, A380s are all out in the desert. Um, you know, basically, uh, Lufthansa, I think, is going to, France, is, Air France has decided to get out of the A380 altogether. I'm pretty sure Lufthansa is considering it very seriously as well. And this is, of course, you know, this massive industrial program in Europe. They were supposed to sell, you know, about a thousand plus aircraft and they ended up selling just a few hundred. So it's a real you know, failure of industry and COVID-19 will just accelerate this. And um, getting back to one of the points that Joanna made, it's worth noting that the only country where the A380 is flying in Asia right now is China. Um, and it's because China Southern operates that type on those, you know, very heavy uh, domestic markets, um, you know, I guess Guangzhou, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing, and so forth. So that's the only place where it's operating. So in a sense, the departure of these really large, comfortable aircraft that are actually quite popular with passengers because of you know, the seat pitch, the seats are a bit wider, um, are gonna be leaving sooner. So in a sense, COVID-19 has deprived us of a future that might've been at least for a few more years. Um, now what's gonna be replacing it, of course, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna see an acceleration in a trend that was already underway um, and once the industry starts to pick up, you're going to be very strong trend for smaller wide bodies, you know, 787, A350, um, very popular aircraft. And during the COVID-19 crisis, you'll note that the wide bodies that are still tending to be in service tend to be 787s, A350s, whereas your bigger 777s have a bit more chance of being placed in storage because, you know, bigger, heavier to operate, a bit more challenging. Um, another thing I think will continue is we're going to see, you know, one, once we get out of this, which could take a while, you know, more direct services, you know, United SIA, 78 services, 787 services to the West Coast, um, London Heathrow services into like secondary American cities. And eventually, you know, very long term, once we, the world sorts out a lot of uh, difficult stuff, um, we're going to have Project Sunrise. I mean, Alan Joyce has said that he's still committed to Project Sunrise. And that's a very you know, positive thing for the industry, but of course it'll take some time before we actually get there. Um, airlines will also be looking for aircraft that have a lot of flexibility that can carry cargo, um, potentially different interiors that can be changed quickly instead in case they wanna have a bit more cargo in the aircraft. Um, other th big things we're seeing, uh, 777X, which is the new Boeing uh, uh, 777 is being pushed back to 2022. So big programs are being delayed because of all the uh, problems in the industry right now. And another trend that we're going to see is on these longer routes, like maybe six to 10 hours, you're going to see more of these narrow body types, particularly the A321 XLR, which is a very beefed up version of the A321 you know, Neo that we all know. And um, so you're going to see like these narrower aircraft going in from like Australia up to Southeast Asia, even potentially to Vietnam. And the narrow body aircraft are all good and well, they're more efficient, um, they're economical for the airlines to run, but you're never gonna get that, that kind of passenger comfort that you would get with like something like a 747 or an A380, especially in, you know, if the toilet breaks on an A321, um, you know, you're gonna have to start having a few, it's not gonna be such a great flight. There'll be a lot of people lined up in the, uh, in the, in the quarter. And then finally, um, that's just more about the future fleet composition. So we're moving away. Four engines are basically yeah. dead, moving into two engine aircraft. And finally, a few quick points I want to say about the airline industry in general. Um, in the future, once things start getting back off the ground, um, the next 
pandemic occurs, wherever this, wherever it originates, you're going to see um, governments, you know, basically cut travel immediately. I think the reaction is going to be very yeah. fast. At the beginning of 2020, there was a bit of dithering around: should we close borders? Should we not? It was a bit of a political thing, but I think governments are going to be acting very decisively the next time this happens. Um, second point I'd like to make, uh, business travel is going to take an extremely uh, big hit. Um, in addition to companies having trouble with their bottom lines owing to the economic issues that I think Joanna touched on earlier, um, you know, these conferencing programs like Zoom and so forth, we've all really become accustomed to using these. And I think that's going to really affect the front end of the cabin, which is, of course, the most profitable part for the airline. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'd like to talk about is um, airlines are very focused on getting back to the way the industry was in 2019. But post-crisis, the industry is likely to be a lot smaller. There'll be a lot more consolidation. There'll probably be a lot more debt in the industry. And so we're never going to see 2019 again. There'll, there'll be a new reality. Um, but I think it's really open to question as to what that's going to look like. So that's all for me. Lovely. Amazing. No, I agree with you 100%. I mean, it's interesting that Tim Clark said, you know, several months ago, the A380 is dead. But in fact, they're back operating A380s to London and Paris. But on the other hand, they've got 100 sitting in the desert somewhere. Um, but he says A380s will come back. So who knows? But, you know, is this smaller, narrow bodied aircraft scenario going to mean, for example, there'll be fewer seats available? And is it partly because the airlines are saying, well, hang on, we'll be flying these very expensive aircraft through the sky with lots and lots of seats in them with low, low prices. But if we use narrow bodies with fewer seats, it means we'll actually increase the prices, lower running costs and make more profit. Well, it certainly looks that way. Like you, I'm thinking more with like the sort of the middle, the Southeast Asia low cost carriers, like people yeah. like Vietjet, like really going into markets like in Australia, Korea, and really offering low ticket prices on a very on an aircraft that's actually fairly cheap to operate on a per seat basis. Yeah. So the economics of the narrow body are really coming into their own, especially with you know the reengineering of the of the of the A320 family and also the yeah. 737 Max, which is kind of another story. Maybe we won't get into that today. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Thank another you. media specialist here, Andrew Curran, he's Melbourne based. He's an aviation writer with Simple Flying. If you ever get their, uh, their uh, news, their uh, AE news on aviation, one stop uh, hub for aviation news and insights based in London. Um, Andrew's relatively new to the business, worked in finance, but he's passionate about aircraft, um, understands the aircraft business, master's level education, appetite for travel. Um, loves working closely with the airlines and has done with Qantas and Virgin Australia and knows about the challenges we're going through at the moment here in Australia and is regularly called upon to give commentary to ABC News. So, Andrew, tell us, what might the future of aviation look like from your perspective in Melbourne? John, thanks for having me on. Um, I'm in Sydney. I've escaped Melbourne. Oh, my um, apologies. And um, I want to make the comment on one of those people... Um, who've booked to go to Adelaide. Um, I think half of Sydney is going to Adelaide in the next month. Um, <laughs> Adelaide's probably, the hotels and restaurants are going to do very well out of us, I think. Um, I'm staying with Phil Hoffman. It's okay. <laughs> Save some money then. Um, I come at this from an observer's perspective because we don't, you know, we, we report uh, airline and travel news rather than generate it. So I'm not going to bring up fresh data. I mean, that's what Joanna does. Um, we like reporting on her data. But I want to talk about what I think is going to happen, particularly with Australian aviation over this upcoming southern summer, and what's going to happen when international flying does resume. Um, I agree with what... Bill has said and a couple of others have said, um, the impressions that I get is that there's an enormous pent-up demand for leisure travel in particular. And we've seen that sort of illustrated in a couple of ways with the Jetstar sales. Um, the other week, the, that scenic flight with Qantas sold out. And we've seen it this week with the demand to get over to Adelaide. Um, you know, people have been sitting at home for six months and I think there's despite what some people say. I, I think there's plenty of discretionary income uh, saved because people haven't been spending. Uh, 
a lot of refunds have come back. I think people are keen to spend money on travel. And I think that this summer with the borders, the international borders staying closed, all that travel is going to be in Australia. In one way, that's good because all the money and is going to filter down through to local businesses and not just Qantas and Virgin Australia and the hotels, but also down to like all the mum and dad operators in the tourism industry. And they've probably been the ones hardest hit over the last six months. So if there's a silver lining in the international borders staying closed for Australians, it is that all that money will be kept at home. Yeah. Um, I think on the other hand, I agree that uh, corporate travel will be slower to come back. I think it will come back. I, I tend to agree with um, Alan Joyce with this when he was talking the other month, he was talking about things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and sure they're efficient and they're cost effective, but at the end of the day, um, when you're doing things like this, nothing beats face-to-face -face communication. Mm -hmm. And I think businesses will, will get back on board with business travel. Um, it will be slower than leisure travel, but I think at the end of the day, face-to-face um, -face meetings uh, generally generate a better, a better outcome. And I think because of that, business travel will resume. I think over the summer, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Virgin Australia. Um, Simon Westaway made a couple of interesting points about them. They, the impression I get at the moment is that whereas like Qantas and Jetstar are being quite proactive within the constraining constraints they have at the moment, uh, Virgin Australia is just doing very little. Um, I think they, they, I mean, they are reducing capacity and downsizing their fleets but I think they really do risk risk getting left behind at the moment yeah. I think that they probably have to do some more promotional activity um, or they just risk dropping off the landscape um, I think Rex next year is going to be an interesting thing to watch um, I see a lot of similarities with impulse airlines um, Impulse were uh, regional turbo prop, turbo prop operators that um, I remember they got 717s and I think they started flying out of Newcastle to Melbourne and eventually they got swallowed up. And so they're coming from a similar place that Rex is coming from and it's going to be interesting to see whether like Rex is things on their own or whether they go down the path of Impulse. Um, I think in terms of international tribal, you know, there, there's there's an assumption that a vaccine is going to happen and it's going to be a silver bullet. And I'm not entirely convinced by that. I mean, the, the scientists say that, you know, first run vaccines aren't particularly effective. And given the um, emphasis that the Australian government's placed on travel restrictions and border controls to control COVID, I think, you know, like a vaccine with a effectiveness rate of 50% is not really going to cut the mustard. I think they need to look at things like um, speeding up testing. I know a lot of airlines and a lot of airports are, are putting money and research into that, but I find it interesting that uh, it's not been done at government level, or if it is, they're not talking about it. I think, um, you know, um, fast result airport testing before you depart, uh, having it linked to your airline booking and that clearing you to travel, I think that would be a highly effective way of managing uh, COVID and resuming international flying. Um, it's not bulletproof, but it's probably one, you know, short of quarantine people, it's probably one of the best um, management tools uh, governments and airlines have at the moment. Um, I find it interesting that governments aren't pursuing it. Um, when international flying does resume, it's I think the absence of Qantas in the international market has created a vacuum here. Um, it's kind of interesting watching what Qatar is doing, is styling themselves as, as you know, an alternative national carrier. I mean, on one level, it's quite funny, but um, as you know, they're flying to all their major, major Australian cities and maintaining some international air links and Qantas isn't, it's kind of understandable that, understandable that they do that. Um, you've got other airlines like Singapore Airlines maintaining yeah. services, most cities, Cathay Pacific, even Garuda. Um, Qantas is doing nothing. 
um, you've got the three US carriers uh, flying into Sydney, um, which begs the question, you know, what's the point of Qantas International? Um, I think also something else, you know, when flying does get back to normal, that's not been talked about, is what's going to happen uh, with China, given the deteriorating relation between Australia and China. Um, the tourism market and the airline market in Australia in the last decades put a, put a lot of, you know, the eggs in the inbound tourist market from China. And as we've seen in recent months, you know, they can turn the tap off to certain industries, what they've done with wine and barley. And while I don't think they'll do it with tourism or the student market, you know, the risk is, the risk is there. And I think it's interesting in the last decade that we've focused on China but ignored other big potential markets yeah. like India. I mean, even in, even in good times, the air links between Australia and India are lousy. And sure, India's got its own problems now with COVID. Sure. Um, but I think the decision to ignore a lot of markets and focus on key markets like China um, is one that could potentially come back to bite us. All right, um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to wrap it up at that. And All right. That's amazing. Look, thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Really appreciate that. And yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of what you say is absolutely the case. And I think the Qantas will be left behind a little bit. Maybe it's um, part of the plan, you know, because... Um, the international oh, it could well be, you know. Um... You know. The international operation has not been making money, but the domestic one has. Who knows, OK? Um, and then maybe it's part of uh, Mr. Joyce's job description. Who knows? But look, let's move on quickly now because we are running out of time, but I'm going to keep it going. Um, and what will happen is Stuart will keep an eye on people dropping out and feel free if you um, have to go and do something else, if uh, have a sandwich or a coffee or whatever. But Joe Cosmano, last but by no means least, he's an airline industry veteran. He's retired recently because of ill health after 29 years in aviation, 18 in senior executive positions with five different airlines, 78 countries, uh, eight different ones he's traveled to, 78 countries he's traveled to and lived in eight different ones. But he's recently launched a business called Stray Nomad. And here's a good overview, which is why we left him to the end um, of um, aviation and travel and tourism and how it's impacted by all this. So, Joe, give us your view on where you think or how you think the future of aviation will look like in the future. Thank you, John. Well, after um, so many um, uh, respectable panelists, uh, they've said a lot of things and uh, Joanna shared some very uh, uh, useful insight in figures. Um, I, I'm going to start with that. Look, the, the industry is, is, is uh, shattered. Um, and not just the airline industry, but also the, the whole industry is shattered. But the airline industry will have a, a very deep impact, will be very deeply impacted on this uh, because it's, uh, you know, you said at the beginning that uh, a lot of uh, the um, executives uh, had denied uh, to participate on these uh, with dinner and um, I can understand why. I can understand why it will be really uncomfortable. Nobody can answer questions. Yeah, at the right. moment, yeah. everything is done dynamically at an airline uh, level. You can't plan long term. You can only plan like what's happening tomorrow. And even yeah. that can change very quickly. So there is no planning whatsoever. Um, most of uh, 53 or 54 percent of the world is still closed. The borders mm. are closed. So Joanna shared some very good insight on figures on a, you know on on um, on the on the number of seats that are operated. Yeah. But uh, let's look at a little bit from a different angle. And I say this from an airliner, a, a commercial person. Um, there are a lot of seats, given the circumstances. But let's think about how many of those seats are actually flying humans, bodies, travelers. Because a lot of seats are actually going empty. Yeah. You, you take, uh, the, you know, a good example is Australia with, uh, with the cap, which will be lifted, uh, we understand, in October. But uh, what are they flying, these guys? Qatar Airways being the biggest airline at the moment in Australia. What are they flying? They're flying a lot of people out yeah. non-australians non-resident 
these are people that are going back to the country, students, whatever, you know, expats. Um, <clears throat> but they're flying nobody in. They're going to start flying some more Australians now when the cap will be lifted. So you're seeing all these A350, all those Dreamliners, and they're flying empty. And, and that yeah. is a very bad uh, 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 reality for an airline. Um, if you don't operate in, depending on the route, and I can tell you that for Qatar Airways um, operating up a Doha, Sydney uh, uh, route, if they don't operate at least at 85, 90% with the business class being full, they're going to lose money. Mm. So you can imagine now even operating at, uh, you know, 40% tops. They lose money. So how long can they do that for? Mm. Now, the other thing about Qantas is not, you know, not being present. I always say that Qantas has lost their leadership position. Um, they're not taking a leadership position in the industry. They, they don't fight. Uh, they just folded their sheets. They put it into the drawer and said, you know, we'll see you next year in July. Yeah. Uh, now that is... Um, that is a shame. Uh, Qantas is an national airline of Australia, and they should be a little more active. They yeah. should be fighting with the agents. They should be fighting with the industry, and they should be more present out there. Nobody hears anything about Qantas. You know, I heard this morning on the news that they're giving away. Actually, they're selling some airline uh, or some, you know, some pajamas and whatever else, uh, so that people <laughs> feel like they're traveling. <laughs> And I, I just yeah. laughed and I thought, is that it, Qantas? That's all you're good at doing? Anyway, look, you know, I want to keep this uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the subject matter. <laughs> look, yeah. the airline industry has profoundly changed. And will, in, in my opinion, uh, for the next two years at least, uh, there will be no airline able to operate their uh, network and the number of aircraft that they have on the fleet uh, on its fullest. It's, it's not just not, not going to happen. It's, yeah. Even that is uncertain. One thing that I believe will give consumer the, 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 the confidence to get back on board will be the uh, vaccine. And again, that's questionable too, because a lot of consumers, yeah. or a lot of people out there are saying, I'm not taking the, the vaccine. It's a so risky. Yeah. So... It depends on how many will take the vaccine. Is the government going, going to issue like a passport, you know, mm, or some yeah. sort of documents that says if you have been vaccinated, I can travel safely? Yeah. Uh, that's a question mark. Um, I, think, I think they will have to, you know. Hey, listen, Joe, we're running out of time because I don't want to lose everybody, but I don't want to cut you off either. But I do no. want to, if, you, if it's okay with you, I do want to dive in a couple of the questions, okay? Yeah. Um, Look, a question for all of us, really, and I had some questions already, and believe it or not, I, we had well over 50 questions from, um, from the audience, which is quite amazing. But clearly, airlines have lost billions of dollars. So how will they survive? And let's have a, a general chat here and just, you know, speak in, uh, panellists, OK? Which ones do you think will survive and which ones will not? I mean, you talked today, Joe, about uh, Qantas being the national carrier. I mean, it is, but it isn't because it's privately owned. And the bottom line is it's return on shareholder investment. And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the salary of the chief executive. And um, they've just lost their case today in court about the... Um, the job keeper situation with their employees because they haven't been paying their people fairly. And you go, this isn't the Qantas I know that would do that sort of thing, you know? But how many will survive and which ones are they? Let's have an open discussion, guys. Why don't we, Barry, what do you think of that? If Barry's there? No, I think Barry's gone. Phil, what do you think? I agree with some of the comments Joe made. I think for an international uh, leader, Qantas should be out there really sort of... Uh, mm -hmm. Leading, the, leading all of us, and uh, they're not. They're, they've just gone into hibernation. And yeah. I think I said in the last uh, one I did, uh, John, that you yeah. know I think there's a bit of purpose behind it in a way to cut yeah. the international down to a very small base. But uh, I think um, certainly, uh, you know, Qatar and Emirates will play a big part in coming back in. Uh, I'd like to see Air New Zealand flying back in yeah. and, and there, and and Cathay and Singapore because they've all been good airlines to Australia. Yeah. I think yeah. they'll come all and stay. 
Um, but as I said, uh, again, it's you know government playing a hard ball that's uh, hurting them all. You know, yeah. when uh, Joe said, you know, with only 30 coming in on Qatar and 60 coming in to Adelaide on Qatar, how long can they sustain that? And then you hear people saying, I can't get on a flight from London in, back to Australia until late December. That's criminal. And the it's prices are charging. Mm. Yeah. And so you say, well, why is it only 30? Why is it 60? Why don't we extend that and get these people back and get airlines flying? They are flying in other places and carrying people. Yeah. We're just so negative. Mm. I made a suggestion um, and I did write to the Prime Minister and several ministers and to the Today Show and Sunrise. I mean, not about airlines for a second, but I said, look, you know, um, cruise ships, cru the cruise industry is really getting its act together in relation to COVID-19 and all the safety procedures. Look at what MSC is doing in Europe, which is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. I said, there's cruise ships sitting there. Why don't we um, repatriate Australians by cruise ships? OK, because they'd have two weeks quarantine on board and then two weeks it takes about a month to get to Australia and then two weeks of enjoying themselves okay and it would be a lot cheaper and so I had a reply from the Prime Minister's office it said thank you for your idea it has been noted we'll stop. <laughs> and you go well that was a reasonable suggestion it wasn't a joke I mean it actually makes sense you could put on a 3,000 passenger ship you could put 1,500 people it's not rocket science to work out how quickly but you're right there are aircraft I know somebody who flew back into Australia on a Qatar aircraft with 25 people on board but of course it was nearly full going out Let's talk generally about now uh, the airlines and their processes. Do we think the airlines have got their processes right yet? And what about the airports? Are the airports in Australia ready for dealing with people leaving Australia and flying into Australia? It seems to me at the moment, it's a bit of a hit or miss. Look, uh, um, John, um, the airlines that um, the consumer will pick without any doubt will be those airlines that... Um, will spend money in communicating and letting them know that it's safe to travel on them. You know, they have HEPA filters, pre-boarding procedures that are solid, checking temperature, check whatever, all of those mm. things that we need to learn how to live with. <laughs> my, my, my opinion is that, um, you know, this thing is not going to go away in two years or three years. No. Uh, we're just going to have to learn to live with it. Yeah. And, and change our behavior, which means also not just personal behavior, but our business behavior. So the airlines have to do that. And they've got to start doing it now. Uh, the choice of consumers will go to those airlines that inspire them the most uh, trust. They can be trusted. Yeah. Uh, which airlines will survive and will not? That's a million dollar question. But, uh, yeah. you know, in the airline world, uh, we, we, we like to say the strongest, the, the, the biggest will survive. Now, that's also questionable because it's a fact that, you know, who is helping you out? How much yes. cash you've got in the bank? How it's many how deep your pockets are. are. You're quite right. Yeah. And yeah. make money. So it's a question of all those, um, you know, those things together. Yeah. Uh, the airlines that haven't got any assets and get no government support, I don't think they'll be able to survive. And if they will survive, they will be a lot smaller. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to come out as they were, those that have got assets and they've got government supports, mm. uh, more, more than likely they will be around. But again, I do not think that any of the big airlines will uh, will operate 100% of their network no. as it used to be in 2019 until at least yeah. the end of 2024. I wanted to ask Joe and a I'm question. Uh, Joanne, sorry, Joanna in, um, in Hong Kong. Do you think, I mean, looking from the Hong Kong perspective, you can look at it independently because you're not here. Um, I mean, I'm based in southeast Queensland and the border between Queensland and New South Wales has been closed for a long time. But do you think that the closing of some state borders has been the right call for Australia, looking at it externally from where you are? Um, right. Right. Uh I think at least uh, um, from a government perspective, and they, I think they, they're, they're trying to protect the country, it's understandable, um, but uh, they still uh, need to 
very much be more proactive to work with countries like uh, if they uh, find uh, um, some countries like uh, New Zealand, Australia, they both contain the virus quite well. I think for, for the, the wider economy um, interest, that's something they, they need to consider, to be honest. So, um, but like, unfortunately, I'm in Hong Kong, the, in, the Hong Kong situation is uh, um, without a domestic market, and they, yeah. the whole airline would basically. But I, 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 I also want to um, reply to the other question about um, recovery picture of, uh, of uh, airlines. I think there, there, there are a bit of a um, difference between the larger airlines and the small airlines. And um, the small airlines are probably, they, they, they will be able to cope with the situation slightly better than the large airlines <laughs> think. Because the airline, large airlines, they, they, they have a, a much larger network to maintain, to, to operate with. And uh, currently, the main, the main concern is still the, the passengers' confidence for traveling. Yeah. Well, this is an issue for all airlines, but it's particularly so for, I think, the mainstream airlines, where the, uh, the business travelers contribute a big share in their yield. So um, continuous lack of confidence in that business traveling um, yeah. sector would make a high uh, yield routes harder to resume. So apparently uh, many um, major airlines, they might need to adjust their uh, network strategy for the near future uh, yeah, so think, to yeah. focus on domestic and regional markets, or maybe um, some area they feel um, they basically need to monitor the, the market demands more closely, more frequently than, yeah. than ever before. So and this is and this is where a company like yours comes in, because I actually do believe that some of the ultra long haul routes, some of the airlines are going to find those rather hard to make money out of going forward. Um, exactly. You know, it's going to be challenging. So I don't know how they're going to take the risk of putting aircraft on because they've lost so much money. Yeah, they basically once... need to assess the potential uh, to profitability beforehand. So and, and and need to do that more frequently than before. That's uh, and and, ho and hopefully they got it right. On the travel agency side of things, I'm not sure if um, if Barry Mayo is still with us or not. But Phil, I mean, two sort of questions: Have the airlines dealt with the issue of refunds to travel agents and clients well or badly? Because I've heard reports that some airlines have been slow refunding fares. And some, um, I've seen bits and pieces accusing them of using the funds to help finance their businesses during the crisis. I mean, it's common across that. That's a common across the industry in cruising as well. So how have the airlines dealt with this issue of refund to travel agents, Phil? And Barry, <laughs> John, still uh, John, yeah, John, some very well and others uh, poorly. And mm. Qantas has uh, been slow and uh, we've had to chase. Singapore has been slow, we've had to chase. Uh, they're picking up the pace now, but I think it was uh, lack of staff, you know, being available yeah. to do some of that and, and chasing. But what worried us a little bit is some people that have booked direct with Qantas got refunds very quickly, but the agent's very slow. So uh, yeah. it's a mixed bag, John, in answer to you. Uh, but certainly, you know, one's memory, you write down on a piece of paper, those who have worked well with us and those who didn't. <laughs> and uh, yeah. you keep that for later, later usage because... Uh, yeah, some have done it really well. You know, I, I had a, a bit of a problem with Singapore Airlines because I had a neighbour that was chasing a business class fare and uh, we put it in for refund March the 28th. It was a, a fair business class fare to India and uh, we only got the uh, refund about two weeks ago. Wow. So what have they done with that money? That's I mean, the money's class. there. Yeah, the money's there. It's sitting in the bank. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? Um, so, so, so some have been good and some have been bad. Yeah. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask about the travel agency side of things was that, you know, agencies clearly are finding it very tough now. Aviation and airlines have been a large part of their business, but the airlines have been screwing down the commission levels and taking them down and down and down and down. But, you know, how are agencies going to survive going forward? And we talked about this a little bit with Barry when he's talking about uh, travel managers as con consultants, advisors. So how are travel agents going to survive? What's the business model that they have to look at? Because the airline ticket is going to be a part of that, but it's not going to be where they're going to make a lot of money. 
I, I think, uh, John, that uh, that we'll have to revisit the whole thing about, like you said, being an advisor and having consultancy fees there. And I know it's been discussed you know, over many years, but I think we have to be a lot stronger on that because we are giving good advice. You know, the professional advisors give good advice and people have got to pay for it. And I think we, we'll revisit, all of us will revisit <clears throat> service fees. We'll yeah. revisit, you know, the, the conditions when a refund is coming back because we've done the work. We've done the, the whole lot, you know, uh, and it's like the argument going on with insurance at the moment with some saying giving the complete, you know, a commission back but you know once the insurance policy is written that starts to cover you know you can't use yeah. uh, something for four months and then say i'll give it back but i want a full refund because you've taken it out to get the cover from day one That's and right. so i think there's a lot of things that we'll re we'll revisit over this period of time and change the rules we have to you know because otherwise the industry won't survive and as like with airlines it, we will not survive unless we become tougher with the way we handle uh, looking after. And certainly, John, over this period of time, the biggest thing with, where you needed staff and available is doing the refunds because the, the machinery's yeah. never been uh, designed to come backwards like it has in total. Yeah. Well, Phil, in your usual style, you've put a beautiful, you've drawn that to a close <laughs> very, very well. I did want to ask one other question to the aviation experts, which I hope you don't mind. I was quite surprised the way the Virgin Australia process happened, um, the sale of Virgin Australia. And, you know, I know they changed the model and it became a sort of all full service carrier and so on. But the whole thing with Bain Capital and it seemed to be all over very quickly. And then, you know, I knew a lot of people who were shareholders and bondholders and stuff like that. And they were sort of pushed to one side. Does anybody have any comments on that whole sale process? And do they think Virgin Australia will survive? I don't think anybody's going to say anything. <laughs> okay, not a problem. <laughs> political, um, getting into a political uh, argument there. Yeah, look, it's just interesting, that's all. Um, and a lot of airlines, as we know, will go out of business, unfortunately. But look, guys, sincerest thanks to our amazing panellists and, of course, our audience as well. Thank you for staying with us. We've gone about 25 minutes over. The next e-global travel media webinar is an interesting area as well. What might the future of hotels and accommodation look like? And we have another stellar lineup of panelists, this time independent hotel and accommodation specialists as well, very much like our panel today, but also some hotel and accommodation operators. That's going to be on Thursday, 29th of October, 2020 at 1 p.m. on uh, AEST, which is Australian Eastern Standard Time, as you know. But in the meantime, everybody, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Be safe, be well. And it's goodbye from me, John Alwyn-Jones for eGlobal Travel Media. Thank you. Thank you.